back here with Project Hellcrap and I'm going over part two of the exploding 8HP90 situation that uh, people have been seeing in these swap cars. So uh, I put together a few reasons why I think this might be happening and uh, hopefully uh, this may help me make a decision on whether or not I want to keep the 8HP90 in my car or go with a uh, 4L80E which is probably my next, next option because I have one in my other car and I love it. Um, so here's what I'm looking at right now. I, I think I narrowed it down mostly to looking at the failures that we've been seeing um, on other cars on the internet and, and other guys posting them. They seem to be critical speed related to me. I just think that there's a little more uh, going on other than critical speed too that, that could be potentially at play. But um, the type of failures that people are, are experiencing are down track, um, at the end of the track, higher speeds, and it's a catastrophic failure, just destroying the output, the output shaft and the, and the casing around the output shaft. And that typically seems like a critical speed issue. Um, it, sometimes in that situation, the drive shaft doesn't even fail. So when we're talking critical speed, what happens is the drive shaft, um, as, it, as it rotates because of offsets in, in the weight at the core, uh, as, it, as it spins, the centrifugal force brings out these vibrations in the shaft and it actually has like a wave going through the shaft. So it'll, it'll be just a little, little wave like this of vibration. Now, as you hit critical speed, what that is is the speed where those waves become bigger and starts actually bending the shaft and moving the shaft almost like a jump rope. And the shaft will just be whipping in those motions and that force will transfer into the rest of the drive line, so the transmission mainly, and could cause damage to the transmission. Um, the drive shaft could fail over time. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the critical speed is being hit in the drive shaft, causing damage somewhere else. And you wouldn't know the drive shaft was hitting that critical speed just by looking at it, but it's, it's damaging the drive shaft slowly, then eventually the drive shaft fails. Um, so this is the reason why you might be asking, why is this such an issue with these setups? And that's what I was trying to figure out. And just doing some math on it, I also talked to uh, Travis from Mark Williams Drive Shaft, and it was really nice talking to somebody who actually knew what they were doing and was willing to go over the math on it and and you know crunch the numbers with me and figure this out. Because a lot of other, you'd be surprised at some of the more reputable drive shaft companies I called, and I've heard everything from uh, well, we can't really we can't really deal with that if you have problems, it's on you. To uh, one one shop actually told me I'm not gonna name names, but critical speed isn't an issue. It's just something the internet guys talk about. So I thought that was laughable because anybody who's been into racing for a long time has probably seen failures due to critical speed of the shaft being hit. So you know we obviously know it's not an internet phenomena, but uh, so anyway, um, one thing that he brought up to me, which is very interesting, is that, and this is what I expected, is most of these swap cars are using a slip section in the drive shaft. And the slip section is there to accommodate for the pinion movement that you have on a swap car with, let's say, a four-link rear or a leaf spring rear, which would be a lot more than a four-link. But either way, all this is more than the movement you would see on a factory Hellcat with the independent rear that's bolted to the, to the chassis. So you need a slip section to accommodate for this movement. And the slip section adds weight to the core of the drive shaft, which reduces the critical speed. So now you have a shaft that already has a reduced critical speed. Now... A few things I'm looking at here I'll show you. And uh, just to you know, be clear, these are, these are some of the things I'm gonna go over of, of why I think there may be issues. So we have critical speed, yoke adapter, and the U-joint uh, angle. So I think this is the main one, critical speed here, and there's a few reasons to it. But um, as I was saying with the, with the slip section on the drive shaft, um, you already have a reduced critical speed now for a given shaft. So say you're using a three and a half inch aluminum .125 wall shaft. This slip section is adding weight to the core, which is reducing your critical speed. What's also reducing your critical speed is, or I should say that a longer drive shaft has a lower critical speed. One thing that I found taking some measurements is that the 727 that came out of this car was 34 and 3 eighths of an inch uh, end to end from the face of the bell housing to the end of the tail shaft. The 8HP90 is only 30 inches. So right here, you're adding four and three eighths inches to the overall length of the drive shaft, which is pretty substantial when you start looking at critical speeds. Longer drive shafts have lower critical speeds again. So 
Here's just a few combinations I ran, and this is just showing you the example of how easily you can run into a critical speed issue with these swaps. So with a 28 inch tire and a 323 rear, which is the lowest that I could go in a S60, which is what I have in this car, you have a drive shaft critical speed of 5816 at 150 miles an hour. So let me back up really quick. You get these numbers from critical speed is a calculation you could make from tire height, rear gearing, and speed. So if you know what speed you wanna hit, you know your rear gearing, and you know your tire height, you could get a drive shaft RPM. And that's gonna give you the RPM the drive shaft is turning. It doesn't matter what gear you're in in the transmission as long as you know the speed that you, you wanna hit. So whatever you wanna trap at or whatever the top speed you think you might hit. Then the critical speed, is um, this is a chart I got from, I think it was PST. If you Google critical speed charts, they give you the material, the make of the drive, type of the drive shaft, diameter, and the length, and what the estimated critical speed is. This is a calculation done by a computer, um, basically uh, modeling the point at which the shaft would begin to whip. Um, I think they add a buffer onto this for PST's website in particular because when you plug this into most calculators, the numbers are higher. I think they account for like a 20% buffer on it because in the real world, there's going to be other forces applying to the shaft that it's not going to be perfect. So you don't want to run right up to that actual critical speed that the computer says. You want to have a buffer. And I think uh, PST gives you this buffer because this is like a real world, um, you know, check your, check your RPMs and make sure you're not below this. They don't want you having to factor in all these variables. So uh, that's the critical speed chart. This is the RPM chart of the drive shaft. So again, 28 inch tire, 373, 150 miles an hour is a 5816 drive shaft speed. With a 27 inch tire, a 350 gear at 150 miles an hour, 6535 drive shaft speed. And then you go up to a 27 inch tire with a 391 gear at 150 miles an hour and it's a 7300 RPM drive shaft speed. So you see already how much of a difference tire height and gearing makes. So. Now let's look over here and let's just get a worst case scenario here. Let's just say that, and I think like most you know cars probably, even with the 8HP90, I measured 54 inches from my drive shaft on this E body. So I'm thinking like a C body, a B body Mopar might be closer to 56, 57 maybe, uh, just a guess. And I think like a truck like a Durango or Dakota might be as much as like 63, 64. But let's just say on this chart, worst case scenario is a 60 inch drive shaft. And let's say you have this setup that you had your old 391s in the car from when you had like a small block Mopar and uh, you have a 27 inch tire. You're at 7,300 RPMs at 150. With a 60 inch drive shaft and this gearing, at 115 miles an hour, you're already hitting that critical speed of 5630. So you can't go over 115 in this vehicle without possibly hitting critical speed on that drive shaft. That's huge. That's the, the truck would probably be trapping faster than that in a quarter mile. And you could see like even with more, uh, you know, car friendly setups, shorter drive shafts, it's still pretty easy that you, you could probably imagine running these numbers that you could get into critical speed if you had too much gear, too short of a tire, too long of a drive shaft. So this is my setup in particular in this E-Body uh, 70 Challenger. It's a 28 inch tire, 323 rear. I found out what Mark Williams was telling me is the critical speed of his three and a half inch drive shaft with the slip section, he guesstimated would be about 6,500. He said that that's a rough number. We would have to plug in some more things to, to get it exact, but he would guess around 6,500. So that gives me a critical speed at 166 miles an hour. So I should be plenty safe on this front as far as hitting critical speed in the quarter because I don't think this car is gonna trap anywhere near 166 miles an hour. So with that down, that's something, though, those are numbers that you, you're gonna wanna crunch. But there's a few other uh, elements over here that, that we were looking to as well. Um, one thing was the yoke adapter, because all these cars use the same, uh, most of them are using the same Sinax yoke adapter, which I have here. So this Sinax adapter uh, adapts it to a Spicer U-joint, 1350 U-joint. Um, what Mark Williams, what Travis from Mark Williams was telling me is they also use a, uh, a, an adapter for their Hellcats with big power because the CV joint style yoke on the factory car is not very good for handling big power. The Spicer U-joint is a much more tried and true 
um, set up for transfer and power. So they run an adapter as well on theirs, but their adapter is only one inches from the face of this flange to the center of the U-joint. So you're only pushing the U-joint back one inch or one and a half inches. This is about a three and a half inch from center to uh, the flange. So on the Synax adapter, you're already pushing the U-joint back three and a half inches. What that tends to do is that tends to increase the, the possible this possibility that the drive shaft could whip because the U-joint is further back from the tail shaft. So I'm not liking the fact that we have to use these. He's saying we might be able to use the one and a half inch um, spacing yoke that they use on their Hellcat drive shafts. Um, the only issue we have to run into is, and this is the next point, is the U-joint angle. So what you have is on a Hellcat, you don't really have any, any extreme angles and there's no movement of the pinion. So what you have is what you have and there's probably a very small, very slim likelihood you're gonna run into a bind on the U-joint. So for my setup, you can see here, you wanna get your transmission and your pinion parallel at load. Um, but that's not accounting for, that's, that, that doesn't give you U-joint angles. So let's say this is a four by four and this transmission was all the way up here. You could still have parallel angles at load, but the angle of your U-joint is gonna be extremely steep because the drive shaft has to go straight, almost straight up to get to the transmission. From my setup, there's a very small distance between the height of the pinion and the height of the output shaft. So I don't think it's gonna be an issue, but I am going to have to get under there, take some measurements, try to figure out what my U-joint ang working angles might be to figure out if we could use the Mark Williams adapter and not have to space this thing back three inches from the tail shaft to the U-joint. Uh, um, as far as just a few more, one more thing I'll go over, and this really isn't uh, too, too critical to the dry shaft. Well, well, it is, but you just, you need to get this right. Um, pinion angle, so with a leaf spring car, on my factory S60, I have this pinion is down a substantial degree because they want to account for about a five degree wrap up under load. So what I'm going to have to do because I'm running Caltrax bars and Caltrax usually recommends um, no more than two to three degrees um, of negative pinion angle because the Caltrax limit the rise. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna get shims and shim this up to, there's a three inch, uh, a three degree shim that I could put into the leaf spring. I'm gonna rise, I'm gonna bring this to a 0.25 degree angle up. So the transmission is a 0.25, 2.5 degree angle down at the output shaft. This is with the transmission as high as I can get it into the tunnel without cutting the sheet metal of the tunnel. So with the factory e-body floor, um, as I showed in the last video, I just notched out the uh, torsion bar cross member, and this is what I'm left with is a 2.5 degree angle down. So we want this at about a 0.25 degree angle up, which is where I'll be with the three degree shim. And this way, when this rises, let's say 2.2 to five degrees in, in travel as the uh, pinion gets torque applied to it, we're gonna have parallel angles on both of these. So this will end up at about 2.25 to maybe two and a half degrees up. This is gonna be two and a half degrees down and your angles are parallel. So that should give you a trouble-free drive line as long as your U-joint working angles are good between here and the transmission, but it shouldn't be a problem if your heights are very close with this uh, transmission height and pinion height. So uh, that's pretty much it. And I'll give you guys another update at some point on uh, whether or not I'm gonna move forward with this and uh, I got to take a few measurements and see if I think this could work. And hopefully if it does work, I'll be keeping the 8HP90 in it. And um, hopefully it won't be exploding on me down track.